Good morning, all. Thank you very much for joining us today. Welcome to the Q1 webinar from Alltech Environmental Consulting. Thanks for, thanks for being part of this. And many of you on the line um, have been clients of Alltechs for many years. And I think this is an important webinar that uh, will help you um, stay in compliance for all of 2022. You'll hear lots of tips and tricks. We have some great speakers for you as well. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged to see the the, the quick spring that Ontario had here yesterday, and all of a sudden it's cold again. Um, and, uh, and I think it speaks to the fact that uh, hopefully spring is just around the corner. These webinars are a regular event. And uh, after two years of, of Zoom meetings and whatnot, I know a lot of us are webinar out, but I think they will be long-term now. I think it's a very useful tool for you to be able to talk to us and us to talk to you to be able to to convey information very quickly and time time efficient efficiently and cost effectively as well to be able to do that so uh this the purpose of this webinar is to it's to give you that that overview of of how to stay in compliance regularly through 2022 not just not just on a one-up basis but to remain in compliance for that and as I mentioned, you'll hear lots of tips and tricks on that as, as well. Um, but you'll also hear about the new administrative penalties and how that will impact your need and, and the drive to stay in compliance. Because the new administrative pe uh, penalties from the Ministry of Environment in Ontario give lots more power or propose to give lots more power. And, uh, and uh, many of our many of our Clients' facilities will be easy targets for those tickets from environmental officers now going forward. A couple of uh, quick administrative things. Um, so you uh, do have a, uh, a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, just type it in into the, the webinar in the, during, the, uh, during the webinar anytime. Just put in that Q&A and we'll transfer that to our speakers and make sure that they have the ability to to um, read your question at the end and be able to answer it live for you at the end. The webinar is being recorded, so don't worry. You don't have to make a lot, a lot of copious notes. We're going to make sure that uh, that we get that recording and a PDF copy of the slides to you tomorrow, so or in the next couple of days. And then, uh, if you'd like to connect to us, then there's contact information there and uh, in the email as well. Not a problem. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our speakers as well, uh, and, and we have three great speakers on the line today. Um, we've got uh, Ros Rosalind Miller is now our Director of Compliance Engin and Consulting Engineering at Alltech Environmental Consulting. Many of you know me. I'm, I'm semi-retired now. I'm out the door. Roz has taken over. And uh, she has a great background, 20, almost 20 years in this business of environmental consulting, an environmental science uh, degree, and, uh, and a licensed environmental professional as well in, uh, in Ontario. Roz has a passion for making sure that clients uh, can stay on top of the, change, the ever-changing regulations in Ontario. Also with us is Noor Aleph. Noor is a senior project engineer, one of our key guys at Alltech. Noor comes to us from Alberta. He was a uh, he was on the uh, the administrative and enforcement side, Alberta environment for years as an engineer in Alberta, and and is now um, deeply involved in regulations here in Ontario. He knows regulations inside out. He's helped many of our clients stay on top of those regulations. So welcome Noor as well. And also joining us is Chris Scullion. Now, Chris is, is with Northern Air Sciences, Inc. And uh, Chris is a long time, almost 20 years as well, in environmental noise and vibrations. Chris is principal at uh, Northern Applied Sciences. And he's, he's served industry for that long. Uh, he also has some very interesting nuances to the environmental noise and vibration regulations in Ontario that he wants to share with you as well. I think that's a very, very, uh, very useful information that Chris is going to be able to pass on. So I'm going to step aside and let the team take over and do their thing. And again, to reminder, uh, put, a, put a question in the Q&A. If you like, it's being monitored and it's going to be 
taking off is going to be monitored and taken uh, as a question either during the procedure or at the end, uh, either way. There will be a couple of poll questions that are gonna pop up for you as well. That'll help uh, the team focus on uh, the relevant issues during this webinar based on your answers to those poll questions. Thanks very much for joining us, take care. Bye now. Thank you so much, Brian. I am going to start sharing my screen and everyone should be able to uh, see the, uh, the presentation now. So uh, thank you all for, for joining us and thank you, Brian, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, today's topic is saying yes to yes and annual environmental reporting obligations for Ontario manufacturers. So just quickly, the agenda, uh, we're, we've done the introduction, so that part's done. Uh, Noor is going to talk to us about uh, annual environmental reporting, specifically in Ontario. I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental air and noise approvals and what you need to know about managing modifications and maintaining compliance. Chris is going to talk to us specifically about the noise side of things. And then we're going to jump into uh, the ministry's proposed administrative penalties, which is relatively new. So we've got some examples we want to share because uh, this is really relevant to uh, to what we're talking about and uh, as Brian mentioned can have some some implications uh, as far as um, ministry visits and uh, monetary penalties so uh, as uh, Brian mentioned we will have hopefully uh, time to answer questions at the at the end of the presentation so feel free to use the, the chat function so Noor is uh, going to start us off off to you Noor Thank you, Roz, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar names in the list of attendees. I recognize most of you. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll dive right into the presentation. Um, so the YES program will include two core services uh, that's re required annually for most uh, manufacturers in Ontario. First, you have the annual environmental reporting that includes things such as the NPRI assessment and reporting, the ChemTrack assessment and reporting. And this is specifically for manufacturing clients located in the, located in the city of Toronto only, and the Toxics uh, Reduction Act, which has now been revoked, the greenhouse gas emissions, that's for facilities meeting the CO2 equivalent threshold, and the environmental emergency regulation for facilities meeting the concentration and or capacity thresholds. The second core YES service involves the ongoing ECA or EASER compliance support. And my colleague Rosalind will cover, cover this in, in the later slides. Next slide, please. So we have our first poll question and uh, I'll just read that uh, out uh, for everyone. So the question is, does your facility meet the NPR, NPRI reporting thresholds? Yes, no, don't know, what is NPRI? So we'll just give everyone a second to, uh, to populate those, those answers. And I think everybody can see that on the screen. Um, so good news about 50% um, <laughs> do report, a few don't know, and that's okay, because that's what we're here for. This is a refresher. Awesome. Can I continue, Roz? Yes, go ahead. Awesome. So, so what, is, what is the NPRI? Uh, you know, NPRI is a federally legislated tool under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. It is to identify, monitor, and track toxic substances and their source of pollution. The information that's collected on this inventory of pollutant releases, their disposals, as well as transfers, are, are due each year by June 1st, and they're made publicly available to all Canadians each year. Uh, so for any facility in Canada, the annual reporting is mandatory if one or more of the regulated substances are manufactured, processed, or otherwise used or released to the environment at your facility. Uh, the total number of hours worked at the facility has exceeded the threshold of 20,000 employee hours. 
which is roughly around 10 full-time employees and a substance reporting threshold uh, was exceeded. Next slide, please. So ChemTrack is like a mini NPRI for facilities located in the city of Toronto only, as mentioned before. Uh, under the Environmental Disclosure and Reporting Bylaw of the City of Toronto, ChemTrack requires facilities to submit their report on the use and release of 25 priority substances to Toronto Public Health. Next slide, please. So for Toxics Reduction Act, uh, Regulation 45509 uh, is the act of legislation behind that act. And the TRA uh, required Ontario manufacturers to assess, uh, track, and report on the use, generation, and release of toxic substances, as well as preparing plants to reduce those toxic substances. Uh, but as, as of uh, last December, the TRA was repealed, effectively ending the program. So as a result, uh, facilities are no longer required to uh, report to TRA in, to, in 2022. Next slide, please. And for greenhouse gas emissions, under the Environmental Protection Act, uh, this regulation is also known as ORAG 390.18, uh, you know, and, and it requires all industries in Ontario who generate greenhouse gases from specified sources to report their emissions if, uh, if the emission threshold of 10,000 tons of CO2 equivalent is met. And as of February of 2020, 2020 uh, Ontario has amended the reporting requirements basically harmonizing all the GHG reporting requirements uh, with the federal requirements. And as a result, facilities uh, are uh, only needing to gather and input data once uh, and generate reports for both the federal and provincial governments. Next slide, please. The uh, Environmental Emergency Regulation came into effect in August of 2019. And the regulation aims to help uh, reduce the frequency as well, as well as the severity of accidental releases of hazardous substances to the environment. And facilities that have any of approximately 250 regulated substances that meet the concentration uh, and minimum quant quantity thresholds, they must a, uh, submit uh, notice, notices to Environment and Climate Change Canada B, prepare an E2 plan, uh, C, review their substances annually, and update the E2 plan accordingly. And lastly, conduct simulation exercises of their E2 plan um, every five years. I will now, Pat, oh, I think we got the next poll question. Oh, okay, a little bit <laughs> a little bit early, but thank you. So we're, that's our cue to, to shift gears. Thank you, Noor. Uh, talking about the annual environmental reporting, uh, so we're going to shift gears, as you can as you can guess by the poll question, and uh, move into talking about environmental approvals for air and noise. Uh, so the poll question is, what uh, ministry approval does your facility have? Okay, there's the Environmental Activity and Sector Registry or EZER, an Environmental Compliance Approval or ECA. We are exempt, or don't know. Okay. And so we'll just uh, wait for the, the polls here. Looks like the, uh, so far the vast majority have the environmental compliance approval. Uh, and uh, a few of you don't know, which is good. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about those approvals and, and uh, what the requirements are. Uh, and I think uh, that's everyone. So uh, we've got uh, one easer, uh, a few ECAs, uh, and uh, a few that uh, that don't know. So, good stuff. Whoops. I think that concludes my bit of uh, slides. Over to you, Ross. Okay, perfect. All right. So, as mentioned, so we're shifting gears here to environmental approvals. And before we get into the the details of the the approvals, I do like to highlight. 
some of the key sections of the Environmental Protection Act when we're talking specifically about air and noise emissions. So those sections are um, section six, which says basically you can discharge a contaminant as long as you meet the regulated limit. Okay, so the ministry has uh, limits for uh, most contaminants uh, and uh, you have to be able to demonstrate that you can comply with those limits if you emit. Then there's the, the section nine, which says you have to have an approval from the ministry in order to do the discharge. And then uh, we'd like to call the last section here, section 14, the catch-all, which is, which is basically the adverse effect clause. So even if you have an approval in place and you can document compliance with the limits, if you cause a complaint, it's yours to deal with. So this is important, especially if you have emissions that are related to things that people can see, uh, they can hear, or they can smell. So dust, noise, odor, those are things we, we kind of have to pay attention to when we're talking about adverse effect, okay? That's just a, a bit of the background. Some of these, uh, these clauses we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to the administrative penalties part and why uh, it's important to kind of pay attention to some of these other, uh, these other sections, even if you do have an approval. So the different approval types. So as of February uh, 2017, the ministry kind of shook things up with their, with their approvals in an effort to make things more streamlined uh, for manufacturing, especially. So to be able to get your approvals through the system faster, they introduced something called the Assessed Environmental Activity and Sector Registry. So if you, so, so Basically, if you're trying to determine whether or not you, you need an approval, um, the first step is to find out if you're exempt. So remember back to section nine says we have to have an approval if we discharge to the, uh, the atmosphere, so air or noise, um, unless we're exempt. There are very few exemptions and they are specified in a, in a, uh, in a specific regulation that talks about exemptions. So we're most manufacturing facilities uh, won't qualify. Where you might qualify for exemption is if you've got a warehousing facility and the only emissions are for comfort, heat, and cooling, and maybe some uh, forklift operations. So you, you may qualify for exemption there. It's certainly worth uh, looking into if you've got that kind of facility. So if you don't qualify for exemption, the next thing we look at is the permit by rule either. And this is again, very specific to certain activities and certain industries. And what it is, is it's a set of rules for that industry or that activity that if you follow those rules, then your approval is automatic. Okay? You don't need to do any emissions quantification or modeling. Um, it's more of a, a checklist type of, uh, of approval. Again, very limited. It's an example of, of uh, something that would qualify for this type of visa would be uh, auto body shops uh, or waste haulers, things along those lines. So again, not likely uh, to apply to anyone in, in, uh, on this webinar. The vast majority of manufacturing falls into the last two categories, either the assessed environmental, act, uh, environmental activity and sector registry or the traditional environmental um, compliance approval. Okay. The main differences between those last two are really just in how we get the approval. So the ECA is um, requires a formal review from the ministry's review engineers, and that's at the application stage. So before your approval is issued, it must be reviewed by the ministry. And anyone who's been through this process knows that it can be a long and onerous process and it can be upwards of a year or longer before you can get your approval and it gets through all of those, um, those channels. The Environmental Activity and Sector Registry is basically eliminates the ministry's review uh, process, at least upfront. So the onus is on the facility to make sure that they have all their documentation in place and it has to be um, stamped by a licensed practitioner in Ontario. 
But once that documentation is done, we can submit it through uh, an online registry and the approval is instantaneous. You do, not everyone qualifies for the easer, so it really is sector uh, and activity specific. And um, there is a process to, to kind of go through that, but certainly if you qualify for the easer, it uh, does provide some benefit. Regardless of the type of, uh, of approval, um, either ESA or ECA that, that you have, there are some key pieces of supporting documentation that must, uh, must be provided uh, in order to gain the approval. Those include the Emission Summary and Dispersion Modeling Report, or the ESDM, which is essentially the guts of your approval. So that's where we are inventorying the equipment, we're uh, estimating or quantifying the emissions, we're doing our modeling and we're comparing the impact to uh, the regulated limits. Okay. The next step is, is on the noise side of things. So noise is considered a contaminant by the ministry and it is mandatory for us to assess it in all approval applications and all approval types. The first step is something called the preliminary noise screening form. And again, this form is mandatory and what it does is essentially takes the sector type, the activity type, looks at the facility size, uh, hours of operation, and where the nearest sensitive receptor is. So that could be home, school, church, daycare, things along those lines. And basically, uh, if we're within, if, if we don't have any receptors within our setback distance, then there's no further action at that time. We can go ahead with the approval. If screening reveals that we are within the setback, doesn't necessarily mean there's a compliance issue, just means we have to go to the next step, which in most cases is an acoustic assessment report where we are measuring the, the, the noise and, and modeling the noise and, and looking at, at the impact and um, proving essentially to the ministry that the noise from your facility isn't going to impact those neighbors. So the other two things that I have highlighted there are the operations maintenance and monitoring procedures and complaints procedures. So again, regardless of what approval type you have, these documents are mandatory and they often get overlooked. And again, this is going to be important uh, when we're having the discussion about administrative penalties, because these are now things that the ministry can issue tickets for essentially. If you don't have these things in place, um, you are, you're going to be susceptible to, uh, to a monetary penalty. Okay. Some of the other uh, supporting information that some may be familiar with would be odor screening or odor control reports. Again, if you've got uh, a history of odor complaints or your industry itself is inherently odorous, this may be something that you, you need to submit with your approval uh, and manage uh, at, on an ongoing basis. There's other best management practices plans that could be required to, uh, for things like dust. Uh, and then there's this toxicological assessment um, for substances that don't have ministry limits. And this is important if you are bringing in any new raw materials, any new chemicals or changing suppliers, we wanna make sure that um, before we implement those changes that we know whether those any new contaminants exist and if they have ministry limits, because if they don't, we have to do this third party tox assessment, which again, takes time and uh, it has to be submitted to the ministry for their ultimate <clears throat> review. So these are things we just wanna pay attention to regardless of the type of approval we have. So just in summary, I'm not gonna spend a lot of detail. I think I've gone through most of this, but the, the major difference between the the, the EASER and the ECA is that the EASER is this instantaneous approval. So once that documentation is completed, stamped by a licensed practitioner, uh, we can uh, upload the documents and once it's paid for, you've, you've got your approval in hand. There's no waiting. This type of approval does offer some flexibility, but of course there's catches. Uh, we've got to keep uh, a log of modifications. So any changes that happen at the facility, we need to log them to determine whether they have an impact on your air and noise emissions. And if they do, you're going to want to keep your emissions uh, and acoustic summary tables living. So what that means, quantify the emissions, 
if it's significant, we want to model the impact and we want to prove that uh, you're still op that change will still allow, allow you to operate within the uh, provincial limits. Okay. So, oh, I just realized there's a question here. Okay. Um, just want to check. Um, sorry about that. So the environmental uh, compliance approval, there are, are two types. And uh, this first type, I like to call it sort of the traditional set it and forget it type of, of approval. And this is, um, this type of approval really looks at all of the equipment and processes and essentially takes a picture of the facility at the time the application was prepared. Okay, so if you make any changes after that picture was taken, it does require an amendment to the approval, okay? You cannot implement the change without going through the ministry's review process to implement that change, okay? And again, if anybody has been through that process, you'll, you'll know that that can take upwards of a year uh, or longer. So just in summary, this is a static type of approval. It's not allowed to make changes without an amendment. But the benefit, you don't have to do any annual reporting and there's no expiry. So if you are uh, doing the same thing that you've done for the last 20 years and you continue to do it that way with no expected changes, then this is probably the approval for you. We don't often recommend this type of approval because industry tends to be dynamic and, and really need um, that flexibility. So we would look at an environmental compliance approval with something called limited operational flexibility or, or LOF. Uh, so a, this type of approval, basically it's not necessary to seek ministry. Um, it operates more like, like the ESER that you do have some built-in flexibility. So you don't have to go to the ministry every time you make wanna make a change provided that you're operating under uh, your approved production cap capacity. So um, it, basically it, it, it allows us to make changes as long as we're still operating under the described facility envelope. We're doing what we, we said we were going to do. We're manufacturing widgets and we continue to manufacture widgets at you know, 100,000 widgets per year. And as long as you're doing that, then you can make the changes that you need to to keep your, your, your business going. Of course, there are some catches to this option. Uh, like the easer, we have to maintain a log of changes that were implemented. We've got, if those changes are, are likely to cause uh, an error or noise emission, then we've got to you know, make sure that we're tracking that, that change in our emission summary and acoustic summary tables. Uh, we also have to provide the ministry on an annual basis with a summary of the changes that we've made, uh, documentation that we're still in compliance with the limits and a statement of compliance uh, from the plant or, or general manager. Right? And then there's also a requirement to update uh, the emission summary and dispersion modeling and the acoustic assessment reports on an annual basis. So they do need to reflect the facility's operations as of December 31st of the previous year. And in your approval, there will be specific dates that these uh, last two reports need to be uh, completed by, okay? So just in summary, this type, we do recommend it. Uh, even though it sounds like there's a little bit more reporting here, it, the, the benefit is really not having to go through the ministry's review process and being able to make changes as you need to, okay? It does expire generally after 10 years, um, but uh, it is a, it is a good, good option for, for most facilities, especially if they are needing to make a lot of changes. But things um, we want to make sure we're considering um, with the limited operational flexibility. So if you do have this type of approval or if this is something that uh, um, you think would benefit from, we do want to make sure that we are um, looking at the facility description carefully. 
uh, we want to make sure that it's broad enough that it will cover your future operations. So if you have a facility description that says, um, you know, you are uh, a you know, very specific parts manufacturer, so you're making a specific part, you may want to broaden that to be auto parts manufacturer. So it's not just the you know, widget part of the auto parts manufacturing. That way you've got some, some increased uh, uh, flexibility in the type of, of um, processes that you are, you are implementing at your facility. Same goes with the production limit. We wanna make sure that your production limits aren't too specific. Again, we want to give that flexibility. I see this a lot. Um, an example would be for welding. You may have, um, you know, X number of tons of, 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 of MIG welding per year. Uh, that really, really um, um, restricts the flexibility to MIG welding. So we want to just remove that type of welding and you could have welding and you want to make sure that those production limits are very uh, robust, that you're building in uh, lots of capacity so that if you, you do have spikes in production that you don't run the risk of, of, of meeting those caps. Okay. In all cases, we want to monitor, monitor for exceedances. And this is really, I can't stress enough the importance of looking at changes before they happen. We really wanna move from a reactive uh, approach, so assessing after it's been implemented to assessing before it's implemented. Because you'll see when we look at some of the proposed administrative penalties that cases of exceedance have some pretty hefty um, penalties associated with them. Uh, so not only the cost of the penalty itself, but then the cost of mitigation uh, and other, other issues that may arise. So it's always best practice for us to, to look at it before it happens. It's much easier for us to design controls at the conceptual stage than it is after they've been implemented. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a, some significant cost savings there as well as um, you know, you don't, uh, you don't get into hot water with, with the ministry as well. Uh, we already talked about, you just need to watch bringing in new chemicals and new materials that uh, all of the substances listed have been considered in your approval, uh, because if they don't have limits, we've got to go again to that third party tox assessment, uh, which does take uh, time. And of course, there's a cost associated with that as well. And then the last two here, I have changing our new ministry limits and model version changes. So these are things that are sometimes out of the facility's control, but we do want to make sure you know, we're, we're keeping up to date uh, with those changes. Again, because the ministry generally will give us time to comply. So once they, they propose a change, they're gonna say, hey, industry, this change is coming down the pipe. You've got you know, five years to make sure that you can be compliant with that. Um, if the five years is up and then we, we do that change and there's an exceedance, we don't have time to deal with it anymore. And then again, there's a risk of, of, of penalty. So it's always important to, to keep track. Um, and then lastly, I'm, I just, before I, 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 uh, I lob it over to Chris, I just, you know, just a summary. So making modifications, you know, in, for any approval, things that we want to consider are the physical modifications. So even if you're making a direct replacement, something that needs to be logged, we've got to be able to document that uh, that change doesn't have an impact. Removals too. If you're removing a piece of equipment, it's still, constitutes change and we have to we have to record it. So those are, are, are things we, um, we I like to remind people of. Um, chemical changes, this is uh, for heavy chemical users uh, or those with, a, with a, 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 lot, a big chemical inventory, this can often be uh, a very significant challenge. Um, tracking new materials, tracking new SDSs as they come in, is in some cases a full-time job, um, but it is important. And um, we can certainly help uh, 
provide you know, modifications and tracking logs and things like that and and setting up some programs where we're, we're checking in on on uh, uh, you know a monthly or quarterly or even semi annually basis to check in on these types of things just to make sure we're keeping ahead of uh, of those changes is important but I think the the take-home message uh, is really uh, compliance needs to be assessed before the change is implemented. Right? And so with that, I'm going to stop talking and let Chris talk a little bit about uh, some of the noise considerations uh, when we're dealing with uh, with ongoing compliance for approval. Thanks, Roz. That was a, it's a good segue when we talk about changes that happen at a facility year over year. If, if you're an environmental manager, you need to pay very close attention to noise. The reason why you need this attention is because simply in North America, um, Ontario is the single most strictest place for, for noise regulation. Um, we do a tremendous amount of um, modeling assessment to demonstrate compliance to strict criteria. And that means because as you see in this list, so many sources contribute to noise, it's important to stay abreast of what those changes are, what the impacts to nearby receptors are, and how we mitigate those. Um, where things get missed on noise, if you can look at this list, is that things like intakes, um, things like pumps, motors, typically that they go under the radar of, in, of environment sometimes, and they can cause quite a bit of expense to facilities and mitigation costs if they're not properly assessed. So I just want to get everyone thinking about what equipment contributes to noise at their facility and um, if they're inventorying that equipment and, and providing it to their consultant um, for, for proper assessment. Um, if we go to the next slide, Roz. Um, as a rule, generally, we care only about the noise that escapes the plant. So, so equipment that's inside fully enclosed from the facility we're not overly concerned with. However, things like louvers and bay doors can allow noise to escape. So it is important to do a pretty thorough assessment of the facility. Um, now, Roz has alluded to some of these other requirements, um, such as the AR report that's kept up to date. It's a living, breathing document. Um, but a lot of facilities have a noise abatement action plan. The reason why they do is because it's very easy to be out of compliance for noise. Um, as such, noise abatement action plans generally have timelines and those timelines can be missed, especially with facility turnover. So it's important to pay close attention to these documents, uh, particularly for the environmental managers and just to be aware that there's some tracking mechanism at the facility to catch, um, to catch any, any sort of compliance dates that are buried uh, in these reports that typically don't show up in your ECA uh, permit itself. Um, if I look at this, a uh, thing that catches other facilities is you should be able to provide the acoustic summary table upon request. Uh, you can find that typically in the, uh, the very beginning of your AAR, so in that executive summary. Uh, and, and finally, you should be able to comply to the NPC guidelines. Now, I'll just very quickly go over those. NPC guidelines typically for noise fall between 40 and 50 decibel. It does depend if you're urban or rural, it depends on time of day. I don't wanna get into the exact details on that, but basically there is some consideration for the area which your facility is in. And also there's consideration for background noise. If those um, requirements, which are between 40 and 50 are just too strict for your facility. Now we can't always use background, but it's something that could be considered in order to potentially save money on mitigation costs. Now, one thing I would like to stress is that noise in particular needs to be a concern because most everyone has smartphones now and smartphones have the capability to act as noise meters. Now, they're not necessarily to the accuracy that the ministry would like to see if you were doing a compliance assessment, but definitely smartphones have been used to log complaints and to make complaints against facilities by the public. So, um, I would say be very careful with noise and ensure that proper noise um, assessment has been done. Um, if we can just go to the uh, next slide, Roz. 
here's something interesting just to consider. Um, with regards to decibels, a lot of people don't really have a good conceptual understanding of how they work. So if we were to look at like, what is 40 plus 40 dBA? Um, what is the difference between 40 and 50 dBA? What, what sense do we have of these numbers? Um, it's not really intuitive. If I was to give this to say a, a grade school student, if I could give this probably to my, my family members, you might wanna say that 40 plus 40 equals 80, but it's certainly not the case. For example, two people talking just in quiet conversation don't combine their noise to create something like a lawnmower. So what I want to do is just very quickly give you a sense of what, what this even means when we talk of decibels. And if we go to the next slide, I'll simply answer these, these questions here. If you have two identical sources, which are side by side, um, and they're point sources, so like fans, the contribution is exactly three if you combine these two noise sources. Um, what's interesting is once the noise sources differ by about 10 decibels, so in this example, I used 40 and 50, there's no combined contribution um, from the quieter source. Now, this gets pretty interesting if we start adding together multiple fans or multiple noise sources. Um, simply in this example, you can see that four fans at 40 decibel would be much quieter than one fan at 50 decibel. And for those that are pretty, in, pretty uh, savvy at math and, and can see where this is going, I could actually probably increase that to eight fans and it would still be quieter at 40. 40 decibels at eight fans at 40 would be much quieter than one fan at 50. Um, so what does this tell us? It tells us that um, if we have a lot of sources that are similar in nature, so if we have a lot of sources that fall within the same decibel range, and we do have a problem, uh, and that problem is, let's say, at a house. It means that mitigating one source likely does not solve the problem because of how noise combines and is additive across an entire facility. So with that in mind, it is extra important year over year, if, if new equipment is brought in, that noise assessment happens, that we get the right vendor information for noise, and make sure we have an understanding of the sound levels because it's much easier to ask a vendor what control options can you provide us as opposed to creating a retroactive mitigation with barriers and sound walls? Um, and then just for an additive interest here, every 10 decibel is perceived as about two times as loud in terms of, of noise contribution. So a lot of people don't really understand that. It's simply because our decimal system is uh, logarithmic. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, another interesting physical aspect of sound is that it attenuates with distance. So what this means is that as we move away from the source, it gets quieter. Uh, we can use this to our advantage because sound is fairly exact. And as you double distance from any reference point, you, you get a six decibel drop exactly. So what we can do is simply napkin calculations just to determine, are we even having a problem with what a vendor has said about um, the potential noise impact of a source. So in this example, um, if a vendor were to guarantee 75 decibels at uh, 10 meters, um, we can quite simply calculate what that impact would be fairly intuitively without even going to a model. Now, in this example, you can see that at 300 meters away, we get down to 45 decibel. Now that's a common nighttime criteria, 45 for a facility. If you're already near that criteria, I can promise you that this source will cause a problem. The reason why it would is because 45 plus 45 is now gonna be 48. Likely you'll be three decibels over simply from this source. So um, I guess without really flogging the dead horse here, it's important that we do the assessment early, that we know what mitigation options a vendor could provide, and that we err on the side of trying to get the quieter sources that are available to us when we're comparing one vendor option to another, especially if they're around the same price level. So if we go to the, the final slide. Um, oh, sorry. When we get any sort of metric on sound, I just want environmental managers to know simply that always try to get a reference distance. So if someone tells you my source um, or this fan I'm going to sell you is 75 decibel, 
you need to know at what distance is it 75. It means absolutely nothing if they give you a sound pressure level without any single reference distance. And that's based on that attenuation um, consideration. Now, keep in mind total noise as well, which is noise that can be sung, whistled, hummed. Any noise that has a pitch to it gets a penalty by the Ministry of the Environment. So that can easily throw a facility into a non-compliant situation. So yet again, another thing to consider. And then finally, with the last slide, um, this is an interesting, an interesting uh, image that uh, Roz put together. And it shows over the years how encroachment can in impact a facility. Now, why this is really important on the noise side is that unlike air, which is assessed to a property boundary, um, noise is, is assessed to the nearest house, residential receptor, school, things of that nature. So a facility that hasn't made any changes can still be non-compliant on noise based on the changing environment around it. And so if zoning um, adjustments are going to be made, a facility really needs to pay attention and understand what impacts that could have on their facility and ensure that somebody's monitoring um, any sort of changes that are happening offsite to prevent massive risk in terms of a noise um, compliance situation requiring massive mitigation. And that is certainly something that happens a lot in particularly urban environments, the greater Toronto area. But you can see also how in, it, in rural environments, um, it, such as this one, you can have an, an entire development go in beside you and it can really cause a nightmare for, for a facility. And sorry, Chris, just not to interrupt, but a question um, from from the audience is really who's responsible for the mitigation in cases like that? So who do you negotiate with? Is that, it the city? Yeah. yeah, literally can be a million dollar question. So um, <laughs> that's an excellent question. Who is responsible for the mitigation? So there is a guideline called the D6 guideline that exists in Ontario. And the whole philosophy of that guideline is that a developer cannot negatively infect, uh, impact you as a facility. So the developer in developing this land beside has to do all their own noise study to ensure that they um, are suitable for compatibility in terms of land use and that there's no undue costs to the industry. Now, typically what we see is that there's always an impact. There's always um, people want development. People need places to live. The population is growing. So typically there's a negotiation that would happen and it has involved lawyers just to ensure that the contracts are, are fair and agreeable. And, and the developer would uh, put together a fund to, to entice the facility to put together the right controls. But that is a very big area to look at. And if there's any development that's happening around any of your facilities, I would recommend speaking to Alltech and ensure that this gets looked into. Thanks, Chris. Yep, and so with that, that concludes the noise section and I hope uh, you, you learned something from this. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. So, um... Then the next we're, we're gonna we're gonna switch gears again here, and I know we we I mentioned it briefly, but um, this is um, this is a re really important, and this is very new. So actually, it was back in 2019. I think the ministry started consultations, um, but it wasn't until January of this year that the ministry actually uh, re released their proposed administrative penalties. So what this is. And I'm not sure that we have one more poll question popping up, but um, there it is. <laughs> uh, so the question is, have you heard about the ministry's proposed administrative penalties for environmental contraventions? And I'm interested in the answer to this because uh, I've always said that the ministry is, uh, is not great at getting the information out to the regulated community. And it's usually not until after they've had a visit uh, from the ministry that they, that they learn about some of these, um, uh, these new regulations. Okay. So this is, uh, as I suspected that 86% uh, uh, of the audience has not heard about this. Okay. So the, 
So the good news is, is that this is still in the proposal stage and there is still opportunity to provide comment to the ministry. Um, so this proposed regulation essentially expands the ministry's ability to issue administrative penalties for a broader range of contraventions and it provides environmental officers uh, with stronger tools to enforce environmental laws. Okay, so I would encourage you just, we don't have a lot of time, so I do wanna get through a couple of the, the examples, but I would encourage everyone uh, to check out the environmental registry um, posting and uh, have a look at their consultation guide and, and, and some of the examples. We can go through a, a couple here just so you get the taste of what uh, what this is uh, what if the, what this is proposing. So we will collect comments if anyone uh, wants to reach out to to me directly uh, and have any concerns about this. I'm happy to submit comments on behalf of of, of industry. Uh, I do have some comments uh, myself, so Alltech will be submitting uh, before the March 13th uh, deadline. So I would I would encourage everyone to to have a look at this because it it will have an impact. Uh, if passed, this uh, is expected to come to force July 2022. So uh, it does give us some time to, to have a look, make sure that uh, you know, we've got uh, things like the operations maintenance and complaints procedures in place, that uh, approvals are up to date, uh, and that you've got all of the proper um, modifications, tracking and things like that in place. So Noor and I both attended, um, the ministry has been hosting some, a couple of uh, seminars and, and workshops. I'm not sure if they have any left. Um, that we, they, 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 they finished that part of it. Okay, thanks Noor. But certainly if, we, if you have any questions, um, we're happy to try and, and answer them. Uh, Noor, if you wanna jump in at any point, please do so, because I know you've attended the, the webinars as well. But uh, just to give you a, so basically how it's structured is that penalties uh, will increase with the severity uh, of the, the contravention, as well as taking into consideration some other factors like the compliance history, uh, at the facility, as well as the risk uh, to human health or the environment. What risk does the, the contravention pose? So this first example is really uh, a very administrative type um, example. So this was for a foundry that was required to submit an annual written summary and didn't. So this would be comparable to anyone with a, with a limited operational flexibility in their ECA and that requirement to submit an annual written summary. Even though you may have all been able to document compliance and everything is in order, failure to submit that report by the deadline could result in an administrative penalty. And in this case, it was a 300, in this example, is a $375 penalty for not submitting. Okay? There are some different factors uh, involved in reducing the penalty. Uh, there is uh, penalty reduction amounts up to 35%. And again, in the ministry's uh, proposed guide, all of this is mapped out. So it is very structured, um, and it, it, but it does give environmental officers uh, um, quite a bit of, uh, of, of power essentially to, to issue these, these penalties. Um, there is an appeals process, which I think is important to note or a proposed appeals process that um, for the less serious uh, contraventions, environmental officers can issue the tickets essentially. For more serious uh, contraventions, it has to be escalated to the director and the director then has the authority to issue the penalty. And that's for things like limit exceedances or where there is a, a risk of, um, of, of human health impact or there's a, a long history of, of uh, compliance issues. Okay. But the appeals process is essentially, if it was issued by an environmental officer, within seven days, the facility can issue an appeal to the director for their review. Um, and then the review, the director will make their decision within seven days. Um, if 
they want if you want to appeal the director's decision it goes through uh the um ontario land tribunal okay and that all has to be done within 15 days of receiving the pen the penalty so that's um that's the proposed uh action anyway so just to quickly go through a couple of other examples where we can show the 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 increase in severity. So in this case, um, you know, when we're talking about having those operations, maintenance and procedure and complaints procedures in place, this is one of the examples that the ministry gave that um, in this particular example, a facility didn't have these in place. Uh, the officer requested that they they do them and they didn't. And now we've got this uh, this penalty, which is quite significant, um, considering you know that's like the cost to do the uh, put the procedures in place in the first place would have likely been less than this. Uh, but it just goes to show that um, um, you know the, the ministry is paying attention to these more administrative uh, type conditions. And then finally, just quickly, I'll go through um, again. This one is gets a little bit more uh, severe. Uh, and there is a, um, a, a bit a bit heftier fine here or, or ticket here. And this is for an actual exceedance. And again, this just really highlights the need for us to look at things proactively. So, you know, if there was a new substance coming in or you're making changes and uh, you've already made that change. When we do the modeling after and we show that there's an exceedance, we have to notify the ministry and there's, we'll have to prepare an abatement plan and there'll be some action that we have to, we have to do. If we've done that ahead of that change, because it's proposed, it's not actually a contravention, and that build, that gives us some time to be able to to put in the controls that we need, so that it isn't going to be an exceedance. Okay? Um, so as you can see, the 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 proposed penalties are are much higher in this case. In this case, is showing two separate uh, penalties: one for failing to notify, and the other for the actual exceedance. And this last slide that I'll show. Again, it's not my intention to uh, to fear monger here by any means, but I think understanding the the severity and the um, the potential for penalty, especially when we're dealing with exceedances, is quite significant. And I just really want to reiterate the that um, that move to the proactive approach that as much as possible when we're proposing changes, we really need to be engaged early so that we can avoid um, not only the cost of mitigating, but the cost of, of these proposed penalties. So I know that was a lot of information in a short period of time and we're, I'm, I'm conscious of people's time. So we're gonna, we're gonna leave that and, and let Newer kind of summarize and, and close that out for us. I do uh, I just wanna check a, We've got about uh, two minutes left, so I'll let uh, Nor close, close us off here. But certainly, if we have any questions about this, uh, feel free to reach out to us afterward. Again, the comment period is open to until March 13th, but uh, it is something that uh, we we are paying attention to, and 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 certainly industry has a has a voice in this. So, uh, if you have comments, I would encourage uh, you to share those. Awesome. Thanks, Roz. Uh, if you can change to the next slide, please. Um, I'll try and do this quickly. So the main objective of the YES program are to map out the annual uh, reporting and EC or easier compliance obligations, create a facility specific compliance calendar that will assist the management with the annual budgets and resource planning, as well as keeping the ESDM and AR reports current, as mentioned before and provide updates on, a, on any relevant regulatory changes. The, the YES program also includes some value add services for our clients, um, you know, such as the TRA closeout documentation, GHG and E2 screening as mentioned before, but more importantly, the quarterly check-ins. And this is meant to proactively keep on top of modifications as mentioned by Ross proposed throughout the year and you know, it keeps our clients in compliance especially now that the administrative penalties 
uh, will likely become a uh, reality in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, I also want to take a brief moment to mention uh, that we can expand our YES program to include some of the other services uh, that we offer here at Altec, such as water and wastewater services, the regulatory environmental and OHNS compliance audits, uh, carbon finance and reporting, and carbon credit and uh, offsets analysis and verification, just to name a few. Um, and as you know, we're, we're a full service engineering and consulting firm, and we've been in business for 30, 36 years now and counting. Uh, so lean on us for all your environmental needs. And I believe that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for being here with us. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Rosalind and myself. Uh, and uh, typically we'd, we'd have some room for questions, but I am mindful of people's times, but we're happy to stick around if uh, you have questions. Well, thank you, Noor. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for attending. Uh, certainly, we'll... Uh reach out uh, with the copy of the presentation and uh, we'll follow up uh, either uh, later this week or early next week. So if you have uh, specific questions, we can, uh, we can chat then.